Good evening, everyone who's joining us now. We're just going to give everyone who's filing in a couple more minutes before we begin. So again, thank you to everyone who's joining us. We're just gonna give it another minute while some more people file in before we begin. Okay, so we're going to get started. Um, thank you so much, everyone, for being here. Welcome to Shatter the Stigma. My name is Katherine Ferrara, and I am the program coordinator for the Bedford Lewisboro Pound Ridge Drug Abuse Prevention Council. We're a group which aims to create a positive and safe community environment by raising awareness about substance use and mental health struggles and the different risk and protective factors associated with both. If you'd like to learn more about what we do and access some of the resources we have available to the community, please visit our website at the DAPC.org. We are proud to collaborate on tonight's program with the Bedford Playhouse. And I just wanna thank Dan Friedman from the Playhouse from all of his hard work um, in helping us to put these programs together. He could not be here with us tonight, but again, we say thank you, Dan. We really appreciate all of your hard work. So um, before I begin, we wanted to remind the audience that the content of tonight's program is not intended to be a substitute for professional help diagnosis or treatment. If you are a family member and need assistance finding a qualified health professional to address an issue with substance use or mental health, please contact your physician. You can also email the DAPC at gmail.com and we can provide a list of some local treatment provi providers. I also wanted to take a moment to recognize that September is National Recovery Month, which aims to raise awareness that mental health and substance use disorders affect all communities across the nation. With commitment and support, those affected can and do recover every day. Empowering yourself with information by attending events such as this evening is a great first step. To learn more about National Recovery Month and the resources available, please visit the DAPC.org. So now I'd like to introduce our presenters. We are pleased to have Dr. Jonathan Avery here with us this evening. He is the Director of Addiction Psychiatry and an Associate Professor of Clinical Psychiatry at Weill Cornell Medical College and New York Presbyterian Hospital. We are also so happy to have Ron Kellner here with us tonight. She will be sharing her daughter Zoe's story with us. So one more thing I wanted to add, um, if you have questions during the presentation, please type them into the Q&A box and they will be answered at the end of the evening. So without further ado, I will turn it over to our presenters for the evening. Thank you for the kind introduction and, and for all that, that you all are doing as a part of this and for everyone that's attending. You know, we're always honored to, to share on, on substance use and the stigma of addiction. And I'm always thrilled to do this with, with Robin, who's often my partner in crime in, in giving these talks. And, so our agenda to, for today is I'm going to review for a couple of minutes the stigma of addiction, you know, describe how it exists in society and also in the places that should be the safest, including in the medical community. I'll then turn it over to Robin, uh, who will tell her story and, and Zoe's story. And then at the end, I'll review the treatment landscape a little bit in, in terms of, um, you know, things that we can offer to, to folks struggling with substance use and co-occurring disorders. And then if we have time, I'll do a brief Narcan training, which will, if you stick around, it'll be a, a Narcan kit that we'll mail to your home afterwards. And, and so we have a packed agenda and we appreciate everyone uh, joining. Um, so, you know, I'm, I'm a director of addiction psychiatry here. And, you know, I, I love 
the field of substance use and addiction. I think there's a lot of interesting meds and therapies and people can get better. And, and I learned early on that, that not a lot of people share my enthusiasm uh, for this space and that the negative attitudes exist in the medical community and throughout our society. And that I've done a lot of research to help understand why that is. And you know, one of our conclusions, and there are many, and you know, I noticed some people I recognize in, in the audience and you know, happy to hear other people's thoughts, but a lot of the core of why we treat individuals with substance use different is the idea that it's a moral failing and, and not a disease model um, of addiction. That is, we know a lot about the neurobiology of addiction. We know how it hijacks the pathways in the brain, how it makes free will decisions very hard Yet the general view of society and, and even in, in healthcare settings can be that it's a moral failing, you know, that it's bad people doing bad things, that it's, you know, kids making bad choices and, and, and full of people that should know better. And the consequences of that view, that it's not a brain disease, that it's bad choices, bad people, has been a whole society that punishes individuals with substance use disorder. And we see that from school to work to the way our prison system is set up. If someone's struggling with substance use, we kick them out of school. We put them in jail if they're using. You know, we don't allow them to get promotions at work or even to speak about it. And the sum of that, and, and even how we see it in the media portrayed as, as you know, all the bad things that happen and we tend not to champion people in recovery. Um, and the sum of all of that stigma that exists in all these different spaces is that it pushes addiction into the secrets um, where people feel like they can't talk about it, um, that it's something that should be associated with shame and, and, and other attitudes. Um, and the sad part of that all is that the person struggling with addiction then takes on those thoughts themselves. They, thought to, they begin to believe what they see on TV, what they hear from schools and families and even treatment providers, you know, that they're a bad person and if only they could do better, things would change. And that situates the person in a spot which makes change very hard. And you know, you'll hear from Robin and from Zoe's story about you know, how stigma can, can impact health timelines. Um, and you know, my wish is that doctors and healthcare professionals were better for this, but I've studied a lot on how that's not the case, that ER doctors, even psychiatrists, sometimes even addiction psychiatrists hold similar views. And the sum of that is that people feel like there's nowhere to turn for help. And so part of what we're doing here, part of my mission in my job, in my life, is, is really to change the narrative on all this. You know, to create an environment where people can be open about their substance use disorders, where it can be viewed as a disease model, where people know that there's hope and there are options, um, and that it's something we should be talking about, you know, as a as individuals, as families, as societies, as schools, um, especially because there's good treatments that exist, you know, especially when you view, view it in the disease model of addiction. Um, and so that's a little bit about the background on stigma and why it's so important. Uh, but I, I'll turn it over now to, to Robin and to tell Zoe's story to sort of further highlight, you know, the importance of paying attention to stigma and, and how it can impact one's health timeline. So Robin. Okay, thanks. Um, <clears throat> first, I hope that you can see that's Zoe. This is my daughter, Zoe. And on September 9th, on a Sunday night in 2007, Zoe took an accidental drug overdose and her life at just 22 years old was over, just like that. I know now that overdose deaths are preventable, which makes this so much more impossible. Imagine losing someone you love more than life and knowing that this didn't have to happen, that there was and is so much that could have been done. All these years later, it's still hard to believe what happened and how it all unfolded. But first, let me tell you about Zoe. Zoe loved life. She was interested in everything. She could spend the day in Barnes and Noble reading about neuroscience, religion, fashion, and then back to the brain again. She was brilliant and beautiful. And Zoe cared deeply about others. 
she would have made a difference in today's world where humanity and empathy are often in short supply. But she lived with emotional pain. Childhood trauma was buried deep under her skin. Mostly, she managed to deal with it, putting her best self forward, trying her best. She was in therapy on and off for many years. But that kind of pain doesn't resolve easily. And it's hard for a child to reach deep and look at the pain they're so fearful of. I think it's also hard for parents to deal with many mental health issues, including substance use disorder, which is often not recognized as a real health issue, but rather one that's viewed with shame and stigma, a lack of moral fortitude, a general feeling of, you did this to yourself. You're not the victim here. But I'm gonna get back to that later. What I think changed Zoe's life course were few but very significant missed opportunities when we interacted with the medical community. Opportunities to provide us with information compassionately and with clear treatment recommendations. Those missed moments cost us. There was so much negative judgment surrounding Zoe's struggles and my parenting. It almost felt like her doctors had disdain believing she somehow wasn't trying hard enough, that she wasn't really sick. I can give you a good example. In high school, Zoe developed an eating disorder in her, in her junior year. Her pediatrician identified it and recommended that she be admitted inpatient at a hospital, and I agreed. Zoe was terrified, having never been in a hospital except when she was born. Unfortunately, when we arrived that day, her doctor had not made the arrangements and there was no bed for Zoe. The nurse said that she could sleep in the corridor until a bed was available. That really didn't feel right. So I called her doctor to let her know. Zoe's doctor, her pediatrician said, you know what I think? I think what Zoe really needs is a good swift kick in the pants. Leave her there for now. I didn't understand it then, but I do now. It was stigma. It was punitive. How does a medical professional not realize that Zoe was ill, not manipulating us? She was behaving in a self-destructive way because she was suffering and lacked the tools to do better. That was the first breakdown in the medical care that Zoe would receive over the next five years and then her life would end. I just want to add that I learned later on my own that an eating disorder can be a predictor of substance misuse later. I learned that there's a correlation between eating disorders and substance misuse. That was important information, which we didn't have. When Zoe went off to college, she loved it. I learned not happily that she and her friends experimented with new freedoms feeling like adults, though emotionally not nearly there. Along with those new freedoms, Zoe experimented with alcohol and drugs. I first became concerned it was her second year at college after a few phone conversations where she just didn't sound like herself. I flew down to visit a mother's instinct and all seemed perfectly fine. Um, and I thought, okay, I'd rather be a little paranoid than miss something. Sunday, we'd planned to have brunch before I flew home, but she didn't show up. I thought she must have overslept, been with her friends after we had dinner. Then I got a call from a hospital. Zoe had overdosed, found unconscious on her college campus. She was taken to the emergency room and stabilized. By the time I got there, they had charcoaled her though she was still very incoherent. The doctors decided she needed to be observed for 36 hours. She was deemed at risk of hurting herself. So we stayed in the ER, in that cubicle, she on the gurney, I had a plastic chair for the next day and a half. That's a lot of time. Time to evaluate Zoe, time to provide information to both of us, time to listen and understand this youngster understand what she did, yes, but why she did it. 
and time to care and provide what might have been life-saving information. There was enough time to provide referrals and recommendations, time to inform both of us just how serious an overdose is and the risk of future fatal overdose. I learned years later that a non-fatal drug overdose can be a predictor of a fatal drug overdose. That was such important information for us. This was the time to provide a Narcan kit just in case, but also it's such a strong and powerful message, but that's not what happened. What did happen was the unexpected, stigma. Stigma interfered with good medical treatment. She was judged, a spoiled, reckless, indulged kid, time, taking time and space away from someone who's truly sick. Zoe almost died that day. How much sicker does one need to be to receive health care? that's also compassionate and humane. That was the second brush with stigma, but I still didn't understand it then. I probably felt we deserved the treatment that we got, feeling so ashamed and embarrassed because I knew so little about drug misuse and mental health, mental health issues back then. And that began this chaotic and alarming period in our lives. Long story shorter, I ultimately took Zoe out of school and came back to New York with her. I was able to access some of the most well-respected professionals in the field of mental health and substance use disorder. However, little did I know that stigma exists within this highly specialized medical community. Here I am, a mother, frightened and frantic and desperate to help my child, at the same time feeling so shamed I had very little information about this health issue at the time, keeping all that in mind. Imagine getting advice like this. A doctor recommended I have Zoe arrested. Another suggested kidnap her to another state where she could be held against her will. Everything was punitive. I thought to myself, is this medical treatment? Are you kidding? All right, there was also a lot of let her hit rock bottom. That's like saying wait to treat a cancer patient until she's stage four. Today, I know that rock bottom is like playing Russian roulette with someone's life. She might survive, then again, she might not. And what would she need to go through to finally get to a point where she accepted the idea of being treated? Would she have to be homeless? Her drug use having progressed to a life and death stage, more complex, more dangerous, and more embedded. I rejected those recommendations and I eventually got Zoe into a treatment with a psychiatrist who specialized in addiction and slowly over time, she seemed to come back to herself. But as can happen with this health issue, it ebbs and flows. And when it flowed back, it was terrifying. I started searching again for help. You know, it shouldn't have to be this way. We should be able to talk to our primary care physicians or pediatricians and find the support and direction as we would with any other health issue. Every day while I searched for help, we lost time. I didn't know it, but we kept losing time. Then someone at McLean Hospital provided a referral, a doctor who saw me without Zoe, because at that point she refused to come in. She felt she was fine, she was happy, and she didn't need help. This doctor explained that there was a way to lovingly encourage her to get into treatment so that she could get better, healthier, and move forward with her life. We discussed Zoe at length, of course, the drugs, but also what was most important to her. I thought it had to be drugs or maybe her friends. My husband pointed out it was me. I was most important. So he loved me and our relationship meant the most to her. So from that, we created a script. We narrowed our interactions down to just one focus. I announced to Zoe in an email, in a letter and verbally that the only thing that I would talk to her about was going into treatment. She started to miss our interactions. She started to miss me. 
and us. And one day when it seemed unlikely that anything would change, Zoe said, just tell me what you want, but please stop. I miss you. I want to talk to you. I want our relationship back. I miss you so much. When that happened, she did agree to a more intensive treatment and consented to include me so that I could participate. But we didn't know our time was running out. We wasted so much of it searching for help, rejecting bad advice, feeling so ashamed and embarrassed with so many missteps. We lost so much time. And with this particular health issue, anything could happen at any time, and it did. It didn't have to be this way. Overdose deaths are preventable. That's just one reason, just one reason this is so tragic. This didn't have to happen. You know how there are things in life that are imprinted on your brain forever? Well, on Sunday night in April, Zoe came home in the evening and I was preparing dinner. And I asked her if she wanted something to eat. And she said to me, mom, I think I'm gonna make myself a cup of tea and go to bed. And that's what she did. I didn't know that those were the last words I'd ever hear my daughter say. I don't think I hugged her that night. I probably didn't. I had narrowed everything down and was keeping to the script. I assumed I had tomorrow and the next day. After all, we had an appointment on a Thursday that same week. Zoe went into her room that night and with her tea, she also took a combination of drugs that caused her respiration to slow and stop. She wanted to go to sleep, but not forever. We were told she died a few hours after she went into her room that night. She made a mistake and it cost her her life. I have so much respect for the medical community, especially Dr. Avery and all the terrific doctors at Weill Cornell. But there were and still are some doctors who can look at someone, maybe like Zoe or not, and think she could do better. She needs to try harder be better than this. They assume she is better than this. And all that's true, but not without the right treatment and not if they keep blaming the patient. I think this health issue is still often misunderstood and terribly stigmatized. One day Zoe and I were arguing about her going into treatment. She said, and it was another one of those I'll never forget moments. Do you really think I wanna be like this? If I could do better, I would. Can you imagine? My daughter needed to tell me what I should have realized. She was so right. No one wants to be that non-compliant person. No one wants their life to be so out of control. But at that time, Zoe didn't have the medicine, the tools, the support to do better. And that's on me. I didn't know enough, but I could have. I could have known more if I'd been more informed. It's on our community. When we look at someone struggling and think, that could never be me, that could never be my child. Can I tell you something? Because now I know any one of us can be that person because anyone can get sick. And when we shame and embarrass rather than offer compassion and understanding, children and loved ones die. And it's on our doctors to treat this health issue as they would and do any other health issue with cutting edge medications, therapy, support, and yes, compassion. Humanity, kindness, and intelligence is what makes great doctors. At least that's what we look for in ours. Thank you, Robin, for, for sharing Zoe's story. It, it reminds me to be a better doctor, a better community member, and you know, I always carry Zoe, Zoe with me as 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 I, I go about this, and and I hope you will in the audience too. And you know, we we heard how stigma really impacted things, and as I said at the outset, this idea that um, it's a moral failing, you know, that people should just get better, you know, is is so pervasive, and including in the medical community, and it can do do so much harm. And the, the stakes are high these days. I mean, we're in an opiate epidemic, a youth vaping epidemic, an epidemic of substance use like we've never seen before. You know, during 
certainly exacerbated by COVID-19 and, and all the different stressors of these days. But you know, we saw 90,000 plus people overdose in, in the last year and, and lose their life. And um, seeing uh, so many young kids start with nicotine again after years of not using nicotine and, and harder drugs. And um, I think one of the most telling things of the last year is that substance use seems to impact everyone across the socioeconomic spectrum, across age, across gender. Um, for the first time, we saw more women adolescents um, present to addiction care in the last year than men even. And the biggest spike in opiate overdoses over the last year among adolescents was among women. And so all the data points to this is the most serious health crisis of our time. Um, and yet we still as societies, as clinicians, as, as families can cannot give it the attention uh, that it deserves. And, and so, you know, I'm certainly doing a lot of things to combat stigma. We're researching ways to educate doctors and communities. Part of this talk is, is sort of setting the, the space so that we can all think about stigma and how it impacts us and, and governs how we, we view different types of behaviors, especially as they relate to substance use. Um, and so I appreciate all of you participating. And um, I also wanna highlight that despite this bad news and, and the surge in people using that increasingly good treatments do exist. And, you know, we don't have the time or space to review all of them now, um, but I'm going to discuss just some of the things that I think we should keep in mind as we, you know, see loved ones or, um, or how we should, you know, conduct ourselves as family members and community members as, as we see people struggling. And um, I surely want to address all of it and, and happy to take more, more questions uh, at the end, but just a quick review of some of the options that are available. To start, um, we are currently recommending that family members and pediatricians and schools start asking and talking about substance use as early as age nine. So as we think about preventing this, this epidemic, preventing overdoses, you know, we want early on people to start talking about their mental health, about trauma, about substance use in a way that encourages people to be open and honest about it and to not have it be something that we have to hide. Um, and similarly for those that have struggled in, you know, as adults and parents to be honest and open about those struggles with, with their children, you know, to the degree that they can understand them. Of course, this will advance as people make their way into adolescence and, and beyond, but the idea is to early on create safe spaces in our families, in our schools, in our communities where we can all have permission to be open and honest about substance use. And that includes for our doctors to encourage them to ask the questions early and often. And Robin often highlights the importance of involving families in the process so that we're all sort of you know, aware of what's going on and, and can offer the best treatments. And you know, increasingly there are a range of treatments. I think one of the key principles is to get good mental health treatment as early and often as possible, you know, to address it with therapy, trauma-informed care, you know, certainly treating co-occurring uh, psychiatric disorders as they pop up. You know, the leading hypothesis for substance use remains the self-medication hypothesis. The idea that you know, people tolerate what substances do to them because of what they do for them. And, and often it's to relieve really difficult states of trauma and distress and, and mood. And, and you know, for them, they, they use because they, they don't have other options. And, and that's part of the disease model of addiction too, that it's tied up in a lot of mental health processes that have also hijacked you know, the brain and the neurotransmitters and everything. And so you know, I think as we set that space early on, we're hopefully we'll increasingly get people into good therapy, psychiatric care early on. And then with substances, you know, if you, I was giving this talk even like 20 years ago, the advice would be sort of just go to AA, go to 12 step meetings. Um, but fortunately the menu of options to address substance use has expanded over the years. And, and certainly AA is a good option for many folks. There's a strong adolescent group, you know, there's groups for however you identify, uh, but it's not for everyone. And there are increasingly wonderful AA alternatives um, the biggest on the block right now is called Smart Recovery. It's sort of a CBT informed group therapy that's also free and peer based, available online now during COVID so you can access it and sample it, you know, whenever you want that provides an AA alternative. And for those interested in, 
in, in seeking out peer support, we often recommend they try three AA groups, one smart recovery group. And then if they're interested in moderation, there's moderation management groups that are free and even refuge recovery and other Buddhist or mindfulness informed groups that are available on the peer end. We also feel though that, you know, we increasingly have good therapies and meds that specifically target substance use that you can do with therapist and psychiatrist. And so there's a lot of increasingly trained professionals that can engage people in therapies such as motivational interviewing, cognitive behavioral therapy, dialectical behavioral therapy. These are treatments that have been shown to be effective for anxiety, depression, but they also help people learn how to cope and deal with the problematic thoughts and feelings and, and, and coping skills that come up when you're struggling with substance use. Um, and then we have medications. You know, I think increasingly we have medications that help with craving for alcohol and alcohol abstinence, nicotine replacement and meds for cigarette and youth vaping is critical. Um, and then for opiate use disorder, medications are critical. And so in the world of addiction, we separate all substances of abuse into one um, one bucket, and then we put opiate use disorder in another bucket. And the reason we separate them out is that it's opiate use that really is driving the, the epidemic and now fentanyl contaminating a lot of substances of abuse, including cocaine, pills marked as Xanax. And so once someone's struggling with opiates, you know, it raises, you know, our concern and we feel like people can't recover unless they really do have good medications. And so while we'll tackle alcohol, marijuana use, nicotine use with a combination of therapy, meds, plus or minus peer support, once opiate use disorder gets involved and people are, are using you know, prescription pain meds or you know, fentanyl contaminated products or you know, turning to heroin or other substances like that, we feel you need the medical treatment um, such as meds like buprenorphine or suboxone, which is an opiate replacement treatment, methadone, or a medication called naltrexone or Vivitrol, which blocks the opiate receptor. And these are needed because relapse rates from opiate use disorder are really high, especially in the first year of abstinence where, uh, where rates can, relapse rates can be as high as 95% in some of the studies. Um, and so we feel like when you're struggling with addiction, regardless, of what it is, but especially for opiate use disorder, you need medical attention early on and access to these medications. Certainly, if you're struggling to function out in the world and the community, you know that's when you might go to an outpatient rehab or an inpatient rehab, um, but someone has to be motivated for that. There's certainly not for everyone. There's also a huge variant in terms of the quality of such treatments, and you can certainly get, get um, ones that are less desirable um, and, you know, I would always start, you know, when you're concerned about someone with a, with a good eval from the psychiatrist or addiction psychiatrist who can help tease apart how much we need to, to address the co-occurring mental health issues and what meds one should be giving for the co-occurring substance use. And then, you know, we know people are going to experiment. We know people aren't always going to be motivated for a care. We want to make sure that people have harm reduction uh, tools available to them. And the chief one these days in the setting of the opiate epidemic are the naloxone rescue kits, uh, which I'm going to do a brief training on now. And so our current recommendation is that everyone carry a Narcan kit. But especially those who know loved ones who are you know, struggling with substances, you know, even marijuana these days carries a risk, some say of fentanyl contamination, although it's controversial, but certainly we're seeing opiates turn up in pills marked as Xanax and cocaine. Um, and a lot of people accidentally overdosing when they didn't even realize they were using opiates or totally trying to avoid opiates altogether. And so, you know, for those of you that are interested, we can provide my email or email the organizers and I'm happy to mail you out a naloxone rescue kit at the end of the event. Um, and what Narcan does is it allows you to save someone's life. And so I'm gonna go through the steps of the training real quick so that I can ship it to you and you can be equipped to have it at home to address someone you see wherever you are um, with the substance use. And so the, the steps of the training are that if you see someone who's overdosed or non-responsive, um, we don't want you to play detective. It doesn't matter if you suspect opiates or don't suspect opiates. If there's any opiate involved, you know, this is something that can save their life. And also because Narcan is a very safe intervention. 
basically if, if you spray it up someone's nose and they're not using opiates, it just will do no harm. It, the way it works is it goes into the brain, knocks the opiates off the receptor, um, and it allows someone to breathe again if the overdose is related to opiates. And so the steps of the training are if that if you see someone down, you know, if you suspect opiate use, or even if you don't, to see if they're arousable. And in each kit that I'm going to give you, it's going to come with gloves. Um, I know people are sometimes worried about approaching people during COVID, but if you feel comfortable, the idea is to at first do a sternal rub, which is to take your knuckles and rub them firmly into the sternum to see if they're arousable, shout at them. And if they're not, the second step of the training is to call 911. And the use of the Narcan kit uh, is protected by the Good Samaritan law um, in 37 states around the um, country. And, um, and so they really want people to feel confident that they can call 911 to get help, especially because Narcan only lasts for 60 to 90 minutes. And so if you spray it in someone's nose and rescue them, they will go back down into an overdose in 60 to 90 minutes because the opiates hang around in the brain even if Narcan uh, knock them off. And so you'll do a sternal rub, you'll call 911 to make sure medical attention is coming so they don't go back down to the overdose. And then it's very easy. You'll take the naloxone spray, this Narcan spray out of the kit, um, and then you'll tilt the head back and spray it all up in one nostril. There's no priming, no pumping, you can't give the half spray. Um, and then after about 10 seconds, if the overdose is related to opiates, you'll see a characteristic, sort of a breath and a, a return to breathing, um, or at times people are just a little groggy and they're, uh, they're you know, able to communicate um, when they weren't before. Um, if you know CPR and it's indicated, you can begin it after the first step, but it's not critical to know CPR for this. And then if they're still not responding after two minutes, there's two of these in each, each kit, and you can spray it up the same nostril or the other nostril, and hopefully they're responding, but if they're not, then you put them in their left side in the recovery position. Um, again, this is protected by the Good Samaritan law. Each kit that you'll receive in the mail will also come with my card. So if you have questions about treatment or you want more Narcan kit, we're happy to provide that. And then they also will come with a blue card, which is a certificate that you completed the training, which also has a link to uh, different substance use resources. I will add just to make you aware that there is one more harm reduction effort that we're encourage, increasingly encouraging families to, to get access to. It was just um, finally received federal funding under the Biden administration when it was, didn't receive federal funding prior. Um, we have a program here at the hospital and, and the Department of Health in New York in the coming months is gonna roll out their own program to make it more available. But we're also recommending if people are using substances to have access to fentanyl test strips. That is, if you know someone who's using drugs, cocaine, opiates, other substances, and they're sort of not motivated to stop yet, but they want to be safe, they can take these kits and take a little bit of the substance that they're using, put it in water, and you dip the kit in the water, and it lets you know if fentanyl is present, which allows you to take the needed precautions, to find another drug supply, to have Narcan available, to make sure you not don't use alone, um, and and you know hopefully you not end up with a bad outcome. A lot of talking I've done. We've, we've said a lot and we've covered a lot, um, but to review, the, the key is that we've got to combat the stigma overall, that we've, you know, we've all got to do what Robin's doing, what all of you are doing by coming here, which is to think about and talk about substance use in our schools, in our families, and then to know if you identify an issue, you know, with mental health or with substance use, that good care exists. And you know, that can involve good mental health care, but also good substance use care. And increasingly there are targeted therapies and medications, especially for opiate use disorder, you know, that can really save lives and, and improve outcomes. And I know a lot of stigma exists with medications for substances, uh, but they really are a lifesaver. And in fact, the data for them shows there's almost no safer medication and more effective medication in medicine in terms of promoting life um, and preventing relapse and, and accidental death. And then, yeah, we all want you all to have these Narcan kits and the fentanyl test strips. Robin, did I forget anything as I reviewed the, the menu there? You forgot the famous, um, my husband's quote, and he's quoting his mother who said, where there is life, there is hope. Mm -hmm. And that is, that is such truth. So every life, everybody is, worth our love and care and support and where there's life there's hope so let's just all know how to do this just in case because accidents happen and accidents like this the result of an accident like this is the cost is just too great
That's right. And, and also because it is a chronic health condition, these substance use. And so sometimes we wish as we tackle it all that there were sort of quick fixes, but it's a long struggle. And it's a long, it's, it's a battle and relapses happen. And, you know, by some estimates, it takes six times to stop using and, and ups and downs as, as one makes their way into recovery. The good news is that many do. There are 24 million people in recovery in the United States. Um, the odds are for anyone struggling with substances in their, in their 20s or 30s, if they can make it through that peak, that they'll end up in recovery. Um, and, and hopefully as a society, we'll, you know, we'll stop punishing and making these treatments more available um, in, in the years to come. And I see Vanessa's joined us. And with Hello. that, we're happy to take any questions or, or thoughts that anyone has. Well, that's great. Well, I want to ask you a, a, a little bit more into that. If people make it through their 20s and 30s, can you talk a little bit more about that? And in terms of re reduction of staying in this in this state or phase or whatever there um there's uh, the biggest peak the biggest number of people using substances are college age kids on until the late 20s and 30s and then you know some with treatment some even on their own age out of the substance use um you know the data is that many age out without treatment but that's mainly because we haven't had treatments and we haven't had the data since we've had treatments since treatments are sort of a new thing in the last decade or so um and even if though we have treatments actually only one in ten people access our treatments and part of that is cost part of that is availability for example there's only a thousand addiction psychiatrists in the whole country a number that makes no sense because there's you know 93,000 people losing their lives and, and 22 million people struggling with substance use um, and, and so treatment's not so accessible, but hopefully those numbers will change, but people age out. There's also a slight bump in substance use as people um, uh, you know, go around retirement age, but, the, but, but over, overall there's, you know, it ebbs and flows. That being said, for any individual who's struggling, especially you know, with opiates and, and alcohol, there's often a number of, of bumps in the road um, uh, along the way. And then there's a subset that struggle you know, despite intervention, just because of the severity of the, of the disease, for sure. That, that's why it's so great that you're doing what you're doing. Uh, we have a question. Um, what are some ways to encourage someone, uh, sorry, uh, how can parents talk to kids? And Robin, you, you have such an amazing story. I mean, and you, and you tried and you did your best and you did it over and over and over again. So what would you suggest to parents who are struggling with the way to communicate, the way to stay involved. And also once a, I, I, I told you before our talk started, I have a 22 year old. I totally feel what you are dealing with, um, what you dealt with. Uh, how, do, how do parents talk to kids? And what, what happens in that communication when a, when a child, an adult turns 21 and that kind of steps onto a different platform? Right. Well, just in terms of talking to our children, I mean, I can, I can really sort of narrow it down to talk often, talk early. I mean, I think that if we start this really early, it becomes a conversation like other conversations. You know, I would have conversations with Zoe about food and I'd have conversations about sex and I would have all of those conversations about being a good person and bullies, et cetera. Um, I just never thought that this was going to be an issue. And I really, I didn't really, I didn't know enough about it. It was embarrassing. I felt shamed and I didn't make it enough of our conversation. And I think, you know, what, what, Dr. Avery was saying about starting at nine, I think that's absolutely what we do. We start talking about this at an age that seems too early, but it's really not. And, and, and it's, it's hard because the, um, it is really hard to be, a, it's impossible to be a parent, I think. And, and you know, a lot of the substance use is, is evolving and the mental health issues are evolving at the same time that an adolescent and young adult is trying to form their own identity out in the world. And, and there's a lot of tension between trying to forge your own way and needing help from, the, from your family. And there's tension in the medical community about how much to involve 
uh, family members in the treatment. And, and, you know, I do a lot of talks with pediatricians who, you know, starting at age, you know, 13, 14, start having the moment where they ask mom and dad to leave the room to talk about substance use. And then they never bring mom and dad back in exactly. And, and we're sort of encouraging them to start do, to do that, to, you know, get their permission and, but to let people know that you can't recover on your own. And I think that's the initial instinct that everyone from kids to adults has is that I'm struggling with addiction. And because of how I've seen everyone respond to it, I'm going to try to tackle this by myself. And, and so we're, we're encouraging whoever gets that info that someone's struggling to, you know, to share it with, with, you know, health professionals and everyone else. And what about think, success stories? Go ahead, Robin, sorry, go ahead. I'm sorry. Go I ahead. think also just when we think about substance use disorder as a health issue, you know, we would discuss health issues with the pediatrician, adolescent medicine doctors, and we'd be a part of that. That it should, This should feel the same. And if we start early enough addressing it, like the health issue that it is, maybe it would feel the same to everybody. What are some success stories? What are you? What are some successful conversations and like um, remediations or mediations that have happened between in families? Because this is all about family. And uh, by the way, by the way, what does stigma mean? When you were talking about stigma, what do you think? What can you tell our audience what stigma really means? What I think it means. I th sorry. <laughs> yeah, go, Robin. What I think it means. I think it means judgment without the information. So it's, it's you form an opinion based on no information and that's how we get ourselves into trouble. Exactly. And it's so, I mean, addiction stigma is sort of, it's attitudes that relate to um, the fact that someone uses substances and in that way, it boils the person, person down, down to their behavior, a substance use and misses the whole person right. and all the things that go into making them. And, you know, you see it in our language, for example, where we, we, refer to someone as an, an addict, as if that's their entire identity or a, or a heroin user. And, and, you know, we sometimes even miss their names and you know, the medical community is guilty of that. You can watch, if you watch the nightly news, you know, heroin addict does, you know, it's just the way it's all portrayed is, is so um, negative and misses the people, you know, who are struggling with mental health issues and, and, and other issues. And um, I, I said it at the beginning, I don't know if I said it clearly, but our attitudes in society in, among doctors, worse towards substance, folks that use substance use disorder than towards any other medical or psychiatric condition. And the attitudes get worse over time. And so they, it seems like our younger generation may have um, better attitudes, but something happens as people age as well that, you know, it's, it, it seems like it, it, these attitudes may harden as well. So are there, I mean, I was starting to ask about the conversations in families, but is there a way to kind of talk about that? Is there a way to put that out into the <laughs> into media, into 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 the way we deal with therapy? I mean, what what are some what are some uh, solutions, some ideas about those things? We've got to tackle it from from every angle, I think. And so, you know, I, I think a, like an example of a of, of a good family dynamic is sort of as we've described, where we're talking about it early and often, and always being there to to provide support. And and that doesn't mean they're not going to use, and then bad things might not happen, and they might reject it. But just really setting the stage that I'm there regardless. And so. You know, for example, we started this Narcan program in, in 2015, and, and, you know, the first person we gave it to was a mom and, and the son who came in with an opioid overdose to the, the PEDS ICU, and they were fighting, and it wasn't going well, and he refused treatment. He went home against medical advice, and he overdosed, and the mom saved him with Narcan. He came back to the hospital, and it was like everyone was really, you know, motivating the kid and the family, but he just wasn't there yet. A couple of weeks later, he overdosed again, and the mom rescued him with Narcan again, the first two kits that were used. Uh, back then and and now he's in recovery for for six years and and the idea is that you know we keep people alive where there's life there's hope as as John Robbins husband says and then with time and it was hard um, as I still see him you know they repaired the, the family dynamic and you know I, I think sometimes we I understand the sort of like apologizing for past behavior, but I think was what was most healing was sort of the everyone stepping back and even him stepping back and saying, I was in the middle of a terrible disease here. 
I, I was doing the best I could and I was lost and I was anxious and I was struggling. And for the parents to step back and recognize, oh, this guy, we came through a very difficult disease, a life-threatening and almost disease. And and then you don't need the saris and, you know, as if you you did something wrong in the past, but that you were struggling. And, and, that, and I think that was really healing when we got, you know, the fighting, got through the fighting and, and that it was a bad person doing a bad thing. Well, I want to say to both of you, I mean, a medical professional and a parent, you are you are doing amazing work, but you're all also doing everything you can. You're doing the best you can. And we're all doing, I think most people are trying to do the best they can all the time, but sometimes with not these kinds of outcomes. And this person, for example, um, uh, you know, I mean, I think that's amazing that he has come back after two, uh, two uh, potential overdoses and that he's all right right now or in recovery. That's great. That's great. What else would you like to say about this? What else would you like to say in general about stigma and um, I guess the addiction landscape? And by the way, may I just ask a question? When did addiction, when did the word addiction kind of come into popular usage? I mean, it wasn't like 1920. When did this all, when did this all kind of change? So we're judging people in this way. Was this the seventies, the eighties, the nineties? The, I think it's still now, but, but the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, I think it's, oh, I mean, when, when did it start? That's what I'm like asking. Ben, I think, ben, I mean, like it, even in the 1700s, there was always like, I think Benjamin Rush, one of the first doc doctors and he had a, you know, he was, he would argue that he was like the only guy way, you know, Two centuries ago arguing that it was by his professional opinion more of a disease model and people have ebbed and flowed in terms of accepting it over time um it's been politicized over the centuries to justify discrimination and, and racial practices and political factors um and you know because of some of that the most recent term is that we we tend to call someone struggling with substance use we, we use the term a substance use disorder and we're sort of, I think the turn from, because it's just been two, the connotations have become so negative and politi you know, political and polarized over time that, that these days we've, and this is really um, in the last you know, five, 10 years, we're, we're now calling it an individual with a substance use disorder that is separating out that there's a person who's struggling with a, a medical condition. As you would say, he's an individual with you know, heart disease or whatever who's also, uh, you know, all these other identities. It's just one of the many, many, many things and, and using a term that emphasizes the disease model. And so that's been the sort of latest uh, shift. And even when people are struggling, we've gotten rid of the terms like abuse, for example, and we use terms like substance misuse. Um, and we've gotten rid of terms like clean and dirty and, and, and all these other things that again are sort of blaming. And, and so we've paid a lot of attention to to the language over time to sort of emphasize that key point that it's it's more of a disease model. And I also we just had a, go ahead, go ahead. I'd like go ahead, to Robin. wanted to add that I really think that um, when we can realize, and, and this is probably for other health issues as well, that non-compliance, that there is a reason why people have trouble complying. And that doesn't make them a bad person. It doesn't give us the right to blame them. It just means that their mental health issues are that much more complicated. So I think when we realize that non-compliance is a health issue in itself, that we might find ourselves a little bit more, we might feel more compassionately towards someone. We might sort of view it the same way we would if you gave someone a medication for cancer, a chemotherapy for cancer that wasn't working, we wouldn't get angry. We would say, we need to try this, or we need to try that. It's, it's like, we just have to, we have to rewire the way we view this and just do it all over again. Start again with, this is a patient and they're doing the best that they can until they can be better. Right. Beautifully put, beautifully put. We just had a, a question come in. It's, um, from someone in the audience, I can appreciate the early and often statement. As a family member, it becomes exhausting over time, even if you do not come from a mindset of stigma and try to approach things in a supportive manner. Healing doesn't happen in a straight line and sometimes never. How can family members find support? Right, and 
early and often to, to clarify, and we've talked a lot about this with youth vaping, it's, it's not, sometimes we think that means like crisis intervention conversations, but, but rather it is, we actually encourage people not, when someone's in a crisis, to not sort of, you, you just to let people know you're there for support. It, it's sort of a call, it's the, the frame is just like setting the stage that you're always there to and interested and in, in thinking about it. Um, so that people can can get help, especially because it is going to be nonlinear, um, and and things are going to ebb and flow, and and so, you know, I think support for family as they go through it, as we provide support for family members for individuals going through cancer or through um, any other, you know, a lot of chronic health conditions have support built in for family members, just because it is it is challenging to navigate the ups and downs of a, a chronic disease process, and so. You know, just as there are increasingly a menu of options to um, help um, address treatment for folks, there are a menu of options for, for families as well. There's, you know, I think one thing I've noticed is treating an individual with substance use. You want to make sure you're addressing your own substance use, your own mental health issues, and, and getting the care you might need on an individual level with meds and, and the evidence-based therapy. Um, but then there are a lot of, um, there are sort of AA alternative, AA moot groups for family called Al-Anon. Um, and then increasingly there's a therapy called craft, um, which is sort of teaches family members, motivational interviewing teaches them, um, you know, some of the things that Robin was, was mentioning in terms of narrowing the dialogue and avoiding conflict. Um, and I, I think there are a number of good books on that, including beyond addiction, um, that is, um, basically it's a family guide for family members who don't want to change and how to, you know, basically how to lower the temperature and, and, and um, understand the disease model and, and how to hang in there and get your own supports. Um, and there are a number of family support groups that if you search craft um, that exist, you know, in, in different parts of the city and country. That's great. And Robin. Just to add, I think it is exhausting. I, mean, I think it's exhausting being a parent. I think it's exhausting getting your kid through high school and then worrying about college and getting them through college. It is exhausting, but it's, it's everything. It's so worth it. It's so, you know, it's the good work. Yeah. And even despite all this best effort, you know, things happen and we do the best we can as parents, as providers, you know, but you know, this is a tough disease and mental illness is a tough disease. And it's a lot of hanging in there for dear life, which is exhausting and hard. And it's to tolerate a lot of uncertainty um, and a lot of wish to, you know, make things better quickly, but it's, it's, it is a hard chronic condition like cancer, like, like any of these other chronic medical conditions. Absolutely. Absolutely. Let me ask a question. Um, where can people, how can people get the Narcan kit? Where can people get all this? Because I know everybody in our audience is going to know how to do that, but where can people in the, all over the country get this? Right. So the, um, yeah, our audience can email me. I'll send it in the mail. Um, each state has their own program. Um, and each, and sometimes it's, it's on a city level. So New York City has their own program. New York State has their own program. Um, the, um, you know, Connecticut, New Jersey, all have their own sort of programs, all, every, all the, all the bordering states in, in New York. Um, but it's still, but it's still a Narcan kit. It's still, still, still a Narcan kit. kit. Many around the country are available by just going to a pharmacy without a prescription. Okay. Um, and you can, if you look at the local department of health, um, websites, they often have links in, in how to acquire them Great. in the setting of, um, COVID there's also national organizations that ship them out as we're doing now. I think the biggest one is called Next to Narcan, if I believe. Um, I, I'll have to Google that and maybe we can send it out afterwards. But there are ways to get it shipped during COVID. And some of those some of those rules might change post COVID where they don't allow you to ship them anymore. But but right now you you pretty much can get it shipped to you if you find the right um, local or, or national organization. That's and great. By the way, I want to go ahead, Robin. I was just going to say the CVS, believe it or not, CVS is now um, all across the country, different CVSs are now um, making Narcan available without a prescription. So and and we, we, wrote, we wrote a, a opinion piece in, in Slater or one of the magazines, me and a couple of students here at, at Cornell arguing that it should be over the counter as well. I mean, my hope is with time, it's not we put up all these barriers to addiction care. This one is so safe. It does basically no harm if you're not, it does no harm no matter what. It just reverses an opiate overdose. And so, you know, you can so feel you very can, so comfortable a, having So you can't be allergic to it. It can't do anything 
yeah, it's, that's in, fantastic. it's in and out of the system, 60 minutes, right. 90 minutes. If you're down for a heart attack, any other medical reason, any other drug overdose, no matter what medication you take, it does no harm. That's great. Um, that's fantastic. That's fantastic. I just want to say, by the way, I think I was incorrect. My uh, Someone uh, emailed me just now. It's not 21 years old. At 18 years old, you cannot have access to your son or daughter's medical information. Correct? Right. It's 18, right. not 21. Yeah. And, and I want to ask you, I just want to ask you, this has been fantastic, but what would you like to say to, to wrap up for our audience? I mean, oh, sorry. We just, oh, sorry. Another, can I ask another question? Okay, um, this is from this. This is from the same person who asked a question before, Lisa. I asked the question. I'm a sibling. It has long-lasting impacts on siblings as well. Thank you for your input. Appreciate it. So, what would you say to what would you say to families? How to deal with, for example, someone someone struggling, someone um, having a rough, rough time. I mean, it because it is. We are. I mean, when you think about the world, we are all family, all of us. So. I'm just going to quickly say, because Johnny, you can, you'll speak on it, but you know something, what I would say is just is if, if someone in a family was diagnosed with a very serious illness, the whole family would be involved. And I would recommend, Dr. Avery, what do you think? That the whole family get into family therapy, because why wouldn't you? Everybody needs support. Everyone's going to be involved. So this is that. And that's what we need to start. That's how we need to start thinking that this is a serious health issue, but one that you can recover from and one that you can have a great life, but you need to do just what you would if God forbid a child had a cancer diagnosis, which would impact everyone. Right. And if they're not interested you don't in, in the most- blame intense someone for having cancer. You don't blame someone. Sorry, go ahead. Right. And if they're not interested in, in sort of the, the ideal care that we want for them, including involving family, then we don't kick them to the curb or let them hit rock bottom. We let them know that we're here for them, you know, no matter what, that we're on this journey with them. We know they're struggling. Um, and if possible to avoid, you know, it's, it's easy to get into these yelling matches around it. But I, I think the most effective thing is to just let them know you know that that you're there and 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 that you're ready to support them no matter what have narcan handy um you know certainly um be prepared as well it's probably it probably goes without saying but a lot of a lot of what we're dealing with is love i mean it really is about love it's about care it's about compassion it's about being aware of other people it's about all those things um it's, what else would you it's about looking at people and not judging them just because of what you see. And that goes back, that's the, that's the definition of stigma where we make a judgment, but we don't have the information. So it is a hollow judgment based on nothing but your feelings. Yeah. So what would you, what would you like to say and in conclude, I'm just gonna see if there's another, another question come, came in, no, not, uh, what would you like to say in, in wrapping up, in concluding, or what have we missed? What haven't we gone over or asked? What do you think, Robin? Um, well, what I'd like to say is that um, Zoe could be anyone's child, um, and I could be you. And I think once we realize and once we admit that I could be you and she could be yours, then I think we start to look at this as though... Yeah, you know, this could happen to anyone. And I think anything can, now that I've been through this, I know that anything can happen to anyone. It's just a matter of sort of the perfect storm of things that happen. And all of a sudden you find yourself in a situation that you think would never happen to you. And I don't think it's arrogance. I just think it's that, I mean, I don't think I thought this could never be me because I'm an arrogant person. I think I never thought this could me, be me because Nobody was talking about it. I didn't have enough information. Um, and I just didn't understand it the way I do today. Today, I understand it for what it is, which is a health issue. Anybody can have a health issue. And that's, I think, that's what I would love people to come away with realizing because there's 
There are doctors like John Avery. They're terrific doctors. There's great treatment and you can get through this. Yes. You know, a, a, a question just came in on my, I've got people emailing me and texting me. How can we help, um, how can we net, help the next person facing this? For example, somebody comes in tomorrow, somebody comes to you tomorrow, what do we do? And how do we lay people? I mean, we've got experts like Jonathan Avery, fantastic. How do we help each other as um, just friends and, and people in families? How do we, what do we do? Well, as friends, I can tell you that every year we have a holiday party for like all of Zoe's friends and all of our friends and Dr. Avery and all the folks that have helped us. We have a Narcan training. I mean, we spread all the information, all the health benefits that we know, we want everybody else to know. That's great. That's great. Yeah. But I think it's just being in there, recognizing people are doing the best they can. We're all in this together. And, you know, through the ebbs and flows, the good and bad that, you know, no matter professional or not, that, yeah, we're, we're all in it, in it together, um, as we would for any, anything that, that, you know, could happen to any of us. And so, um, and life is so short and it's so hard sometimes. And, 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 you know, it's, what else can we do, but, but, but be kind and, and hang on to each other as we make our way through it. Well, you all are so remarkable. I, I can't thank you enough for being here tonight, for imparting this, <laughs> telling your story, being here and participating in, you know, what I think is a very, very important conversation. And here, I know here's Catherine. And by the way, I'm going to say from the Bedford Playhouse, because our Dan Friedman is here, not here tonight. We really appreciate this through Let's Talk at the Bedford Playhouse and through DAPC and Catherine's going to take it away, but thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I just wanted to, I just wanted to um, echo Vanessa's sentiments. Thank you so much for being here tonight and delivering this really important message. Um, we cannot tell you how much we appreciate you taking the time to be here for our community. And thank you to everyone who took the time to attend this evening. Um, as I stated in the beginning, making time to really get this information is really the first step in helping stop the stigma, which we spoke a lot about tonight. So again, thank you to everyone involved in this evening and I wish everyone a wonderful night. Thank you. Thanks everyone. Thank you. Thank All you the best. So